roughly one billion women, men and children live in so-called slums, favelas, or informal settlements. They are in the first place characterized by the fact that people have constructed their houses and neighborhoods themselves, without architects, without planners, and without the government, especially. There is a lot of poverty, there is a lot of misery, but there is also a lot of creativity and ingenuity in these places. Slums can often be found in the urban agglomerations of smaller and bigger cities in the so-called, again, so-called uh, global south. 60 million people each year move into cities in developing countries. Many of these people are going to live in slums. Today, one out of six or seven lives in slums. By 2030, it will be one out of four if we do not change our urban policies as we have heard before. Considering these facts, it's probably about time to understand that the future, to a large extent, will be made and decided in these places. They are the gates to the future, and it's not their future, it's our future, because it's one planet and it's one ecosystem. If you look at the world map, we understand that the entire global south is covered by slums. Some countries have a share of 30 percent, some of 70, and some get close to 100. While it's not so important whether this map is exactly like that or whether it's 90 or 70, it's just really a lot. My learning and my journey in how we could deal with this form of uh, global urbanization and migration happened in Brazil, precisely in Sao Paulo, a metropolitan region of 20 million inhabitants. I worked as an urban designer and planner for several years at the, the local uh, government in the local slum upgrading program. Brazil can somehow uh, be considered as a pioneer in so-called slum upgrading processes, not only because of the existing instruments, and not only because of the extremely progressive legislation, which requires mandatory the, the participation of the population in planning processes, but above all, because slums, favelas, as they're called in Brazil, are considered and accepted as part of the city of society and also of history. So working as an urban designer at SEHAB, I, I experienced, I learned how you can deal with so-called high-risk areas, constant uh, flood plains, how they can be redeveloped. But I also experienced uh, how difficult it is to retroactively implement urban infrastructure in existing neighborhoods, because the alleys are so uh, narrow and the houses would collapse if you dig too deep. So it often felt more like surgery than constructional work. <laughs> and I also saw how difficult it is to implement in a satisfying way new dense social housing close to the favela because uh, uh, we didn't want to separate people from their communities so that it results in a satisfying way, it happens in a satisfying way. But I also uh, experienced, I felt how great the spirit in these communities is and how people engage with all kinds of activities, sports, culture, social activities, uh, whatsoever. Despite of the fact that Sao Paulo is probably doing a great job, and as a wealthy city, it can afford to spend 4% of its municipal budget on slum upgrading, it will never ever manage to upgrade all the 1,500 favelas 
2,000 irregular settlements and more than 1,000 run-down, overcrowded tenement, ha tenement houses only in the central area, especially if we consider that we talk about 30% of the people. So 4% of the money for 30% of the people. But what if we can turn this upside down? What if we can transform slums into powerful startup communities? What if we can really empower them, enable them through more micromanagement, through more micro-entrepreneurial activities? What if the problem, million of slum dwellers, suddenly is the solution? So we tried such an approach in the wonderful uh, metropolitan region of the Serra da Cantareira, which is one of the largest urban for rainforests in the world, which is, as you can see on this picture, bordered by many, many dozens of favelas. So we argued, what if we do not see the problems? A nature reserve which is endangered, many dozens of favelas yet to be upgraded, no money, and a huge unemployment rate amongst the population. What if they can become the gate to the Serra da Cantareira? What if we can promote a lot of entrepreneurial activities which are related to ecology, to ecotourism, uh, these kind of things. So we developed together with local actors and stakeholders, many NGOs, um, inhabitants, uh, many, many people, a lot of meetings, <laughs> a lot of work, <laughs> and we suggested more than 40 entrepreneurial activities, some of them small, some of them requiring little investment, some requiring a bit larger investment. And we also uh, <coughs> edited a little neighborhood guide, playing with design and style of the famous wallpaper travel guides, where we did suggest to the population more than 50 ideas how with little means and really little money they can upgrade uh, their own uh, neighborhoods. So they would not only become micro-entrepreneurs, but they would become small-scale micro-urban developers. The good thing about this, we really need little, little money compared to the, to the investment we would usually have <coughs> at the city hall. And secondly, people can engage of getting instead of getting frustrated because the government doesn't pick up. And the other thing is, I believe, governments have to learn that they cannot create. They can only promote, for instance, smart urban policy, but they cannot create. Who can create? These are the people, the entrepreneurs on the ground. So my learning then took me to, to Nigeria, precisely to Lagos. <coughs> Nigeria is one of the largest countries in the world, officially with a slum population uh, of 70%. There is no slum upgrading program in Lagos, so we're not dealing there with, a, let's say, a Brazilian situation. In Lagos, <coughs> we're busy, in the meantime, with my own firm, we're busy with a slum at and on the water, without basic sanitation, without urban infrastructure. But one should also know that the entire city of Lagos, which is one of the largest in the world, has no black water treatment plant. So these guys are not alone, without having basic sanitation. Makoko is a bustling slum, especially women engage in all kinds of economic uh, activities. Unfortunately, as our field research has revealed, most people do not make enough money to make a living. 50%, 40%, sorry, live even uh, below poverty line. So we're confronted with the fact that people work hard all day and they do not make enough money. They just manage, as they say. So we said it's very ambitious. I'm, <laughs> I'm aware of the fact. But we said, what if we can combine the lack of having no urban infrastructure, of having no governmental services, 
with the fact that we do not have enough income in the neighborhood. What we, if we can turn that into, again, entrepreneurial opportunities. Right now, we're, we, we have the situation that the little money that people have goes out of the community. The food is imported, as we have heard also from Rob this morning, from Norway. The fish they smoke as a, as a basic business, actually, comes from Norway, frozen. Additionally, many people have debt, and the consumed products would end up as untreated organic and human and also solid waste in the lagoon, and we have zero jobs. We're currently trying to turn that into closed-loop cycles, creating a lot of job opportunities, creating a, together with the community, a micro waste management system, working on new manufacturing activities, how you can process waste into new products. We're also working currently on the design and implementation of biogas plants, extremely simple, low-tech technology where you only have bags with human waste and, and sunlight to produce energy, to produce fertilizer, to again uh, produce uh, homegrown food in order to make people save money. Something that is very dear to my heart is uh, these shared facilities for the women. So we try to see how those biogas plants can become neighborhood hotspots. They become, can become breeding rooms for the girls. They can become uh, homegrown um, food knowledge centers. Uh, they can become uh, uh, rooms for manufacturing activities for the women. Because empowering the women is even more important than just empowering people, because the women run Makoko, and the women basically also run Africa. <laughs> and for all this, and these are the good news, we really need little money. Compared to the top-down ad flows we have, millions and billions of, of dollars or euros or whatever, we need very little money to do these things. And we can directly empower and enable the communities. So, these guys are ready actually to take action, and maybe you would like to join in as well. <laughs> Thank you.